This is a pre-recorded presentation video for the OZSW 2020. Hello, I'm Takahiro Yamada. Strict finitism is a standpoint according to which we can say something exists only if we can construct it in practice. As far as I know, this kind of idea first appeared as early as 1934, when Dennis expressed his complaint about intuitionism. In that context, there seems to be no distinction between intuitionism and strict finitism, and he wondered if the intuitionist shouldn't say that this is not a natural number, because this is too big to construct in practice. Later, intuitionism was taken to be the standpoint that uses the notion of constructability in principle, not in practice, but is the standpoint that uses constructivity in practice not a viable option? The Russian mathematician Yeseni Bobin tried to pursue this direction. He sent a letter to Brower in 1958, saying, Dear Professor Brower, I'm one of those who continue your criticism of the classical point of view, and he pushed constructivism beyond intuitionism. This standpoint is not that finitistic, because we can't construct infinitely many numbers in practice. But one may say that there is a problem, because where to draw a line? For instance, Bernays' number may be too big to construct in practice, so let's say this is above the line, and one is constructible, and so this is below the line. But can we really say what are constructible in practice and what are not, precisely? Actually, the strict scientist doesn't draw a line. A story of Yoseni Bopin is reported in Harvey Friedman's Seminar Notes 2002, where Friedman asked, if two is a number, and Yoseni Bopin said, yes, Friedman asked again, what about two squared? Yoseni Bopin said, yes, after a pause. This went on, and in the end, it was apparent that Yesen Bopin was going to say yes to each question, but with a proportionately long pause. In this presentation, I'm going to propose strict finitistic logic as a formalization of this standpoint, but I will do so in the classical framework as a first approximation. In what follows, I will first give a, a little bit more detailed and philosophical description of the standpoint, and then I will present a semantics and a proof theory that are sound and complete. As we saw, Bernays and Seni Bobin were two mathematicians who entertained strict finitistic ideas. Now, let me introduce two philosophers who discussed strict finitism. The first is Dammit. He wrote a paper to attack strict finitism, saying that it is semantically inconsistent in favor of intuitionism. The second is right. He wrote a meticulous paper to defend strict finitism from Dammit's attack, and rather to return an attack upon intuitionism. We have no room to look into this debate, but thanks to this debate, we have a clear understanding of what strict finitism is like. I think that saying strict finitism is the intuitionist's finitism is not bad as a slogan. On the one hand, intuitionism is a kind of constructivism that uses the notion of possibility in principle. So according to the intuitionist, numbers are constructible in principle, and therefore, as a result, all natural numbers are legitimate to them. And as for statements, they think that statements hold if they are provable in principle, and this is why uh, they famously reject the law of the excluded middle, LEM. Similarly, strict finitism is also a kind of constructivism, but with less power because it uses possibility in practice. According to the strict finitists, therefore, numbers are constructible in practice, and not all natural numbers are legitimate. They also think that statements hold if they are provable in practice, so they also reject the law of excluded middle. Here, interestingly, they agree with the intuitionist. To visualize a little bit, if this is intuitionism, 
then strict finitism is a downsized version of intuitionism. They both are constructivists, but strict finitism is finitistic, and uh, now the guiding principle is the notion of possibility in practice. Now, what are strict finitistic numbers? To start off, of course, zero is constructible in practice, so it is a number. But thinking about the notion of uh, constructibility in practice, we want to say that if we can construct uh, something in practice, then we should be able to uh, construct the next thing uh, in practice too. So we say that if n is a number, then the successor of it is also a number. But because this is a, a finitistic standpoint, the legitimate numbers are bounded from above. This means that we should give up induction in the normal sense, which is on the natural numbers. The attempt of formalizing strict finitistic reasoning into a logic has already been done by Wright. In his paper, he included an outline of a strict finitist semantics for first order arithmetic. But he tried to form and develop uh, strict finitistic logic in the strict finitistic framework itself, which meant that he could not use the LEM, also he could not use uh, induction in the normal sense. It was no doubt a hard job to do. So what I will do is to reconstruct Wright's logic in the classical framework. Also, I'm going to restrict myself in the proportional part. But I hope that this could be a first step towards the future where strict finitism is considered to be another promising constructivist standpoint other than intuitionism. Now, let us see the semantics of the logic. We'll start with the language, but since strict finitism is a finitistic standpoint, which is about numbers, we have arithmetic built inside. So we start with the definition of the terms. And zero is a term, and if A and B are terms, then the successor of A and the sum and the product of A and B are terms. We use these to define the formulas. Bottom is a formula, and if and b are terms, then the equation between them is also a formula, and these are the atomic formulas for us. The rest is as usual. We have conjunction, disjunction, implication, and negation. Our semantics is a cryptic style semantics, and we use tree like structures to uh, model agents' possible learning histories. The rules for forming a model are as follows. Each node has two bags. One is for the expressions available at that stage. The other is for the formulas that are true at that stage. Each model starts with the root node with a zero as an expression available and nothing else. Above each node, we list up all possible developments. But learning is done one by one, from the easiest to the hardest so that if the agent learns a new expression, they do not learn a new equation. If the agent discovers a true arithmetical fact, they do not acquire a new expression. And the model expands this way, indefinitely. When Wright defined these rules, the models were also strict finitistic objects. So even though each node had its own successors, the height of the whole structure was finite or more precisely, strict finitistic, which was not so much clear. But now that we think in the classical framework, there's only one model to consider. One can say that this classical model is trying to capture the agent that is an everlasting community. Now, we define the forcing conditions as follows. If A is atomic, then it holds at K, if and only if we can find it in the green bubble of K. Conjunction and disjunction are as usual, and what is special about this semantics are implication and negation. Implication A to B holds at K, if and only if, for any K prime at which A holds, there exists K double prime at which B holds. Note that B doesn't have to hold at K prime, just as 
intuitionistic logic requires. This is to say that implication A to B is like an uh, instruction that assures an uh, success in practice. If you have found A, then with a suitable instruction, you should be able to find B in the future in practice. The negation of A holds at K if and only if there is no node at which A holds. This is to say that no matter what path the agent may follow, there is no possibility that the agent finds A. In a sense, in this semantics, negation is global. We can check that the LM is not valid. Just think of this disjunction. 0 to 0 is really a, a very simple equation, but at the root, this doesn't hold because the root has not any atomic formula. But uh, there is indeed a, a node at which this holds. Therefore, the negation of it is not true anywhere. So this disjunction is not true at the root. Here, I'd like to point out one thing interesting about this semantics. Even the easiest formula, 0 to 0, is not valid. So one may think that validity of this semantics is rather a strong property but we can invent a, a very useful intermediate property of a formula, prevalence, by which I want to mean almost everywhere, almost valid. Now, let us look into the model again. It is true that uh, we can even keep avoiding getting 0 to 0 forever. For instance, starting from this root, we choose this node, and again, um, avoiding 0 is 0, we get this node and again avoiding 0 to 0 we choose this and we continue so it is true that there exists a path on which 0 to 0 never appears but as you may have noticed 0 to 0 is always an option namely it is prevalent um, now i'm going to introduce the definition of prevalence i'm going to define uh, prevalence of a term and prevalence of a formula. Um, a term or, or a formula is prevalent if and only if for any node k there exists another node at which the term or the formula exists. This notion tells us a lot about the model. We, uh, we can prove that uh, first every term is prevalent. This means that the agent can learn any ex expression from any point. Secondly, if a formula is satisfiable, then it is prevalent. This is a remarkable feature because this means that uh, once a formula holds, it holds almost everywhere. Thinking that prevalence is a weaker version of validity, this is interesting. Um, but uh, more importantly, one can prove that uh, the following are uh, equivalent. A formula um, A to B is valid. A to B is prevalent. And A is not prevalent. Or B is prevalent. This means that uh, we can interpret validity of, inter of implication as prevalence of implication, and at the level of prevalence, implication behaves as the, as the same as um, classical implication. This fact uh, is very useful uh, when we prove completeness. Then, let us move on to the proof theory, which I claim to be sound and complete with respect to validity, uh, although I can give a proof in this presentation. I'm going to present a second calculus, which I call SF, standing for strict finitism. This is a second calculus with a sequence in the usual form, but it has extra kinds of initial sequence. As usual, if A is atomic, then A turns to A is an initial sequence, but if A is atomic and prevalent, then not A turnstile 
is also an initial sequence. And if A is atomic and not prevalent, then A turn style is an initial sequence. As if has weakening contraction and exchange as usual, but the cut rule of this system is in this form. This is classical cut, but uh, the context can't be empty. This means that in this system, modus ponens of this form is not allowed. I think this is a very salient feature. And the set of logical rules of SF is a mixture of classical and intuitionistic rules. Note here that G3IN is intuitionistic multi succeeding sequence calculus. And the conjunction and the disjunction rules of SF are those of classical and intuitionistic logic. SF uses the implication left rule of classical logic, and it uses the implication right rule of intuitionistic logic. And as of negation, SF uses the uh, negation left rule of classical logic and a modified version of the negation right rule of classical logic. But in the end, we can show that these rules are derivable if we regard the negation of A as an abbreviation of A to the bottom. So we don't have to pay much attention to these negation rules. This system is strong enough to prove all the intuitionistic principles. But furthermore, we can get a lot of classical results. For instance, we can derive a double negation elimination <coughs> contraposition of this form, Parsi's law, and uh, De Morgan's law of this form. So uh, it may not be wrong to say that strict finitism is the intuitionist finitism, but when it is put in the classical framework, it goes beyond intuitionism, and it gets quite close to classical logic. Although, one should note that the law of exclude middle is not uh, derivable in this system. In the first place, it is not semantically valid. We might be able to explain this fact by comparing the rules of these two systems, but it is not so simple. Surely, as if it has more initial sequence and a, a stronger implication left rule than G3IM, but as if it's cut, it's partly stronger and partly weaker than G3IM's cut, which is single succeeding. It is true that as if it's cut is multi succeeding, but it doesn't allow us to do modus ponens. And as the final topic of this presentation, let me briefly state soundness and complete results of strict finitistic logic. One can prove soundness in this form, and for this notation of implication, please refer to this definition. Also, one can prove uh, weak completeness in this form, and also, as a corollary to this, one can prove disjunction property. As of uh, strong completeness about logical consequences, this holds if the uh, logical consequences are those between implicational formulas. It is time to summarize and end this presentation. In this presentation, I gave strict finitistic logic as a formalization of strict finitism. The formalization was in the classical framework, but I claimed that I was able to give a sound and complete pair of uh, semantics and the proof theory. This classically seen strict finitistic logic tries to capture strict finitistic reasoning about an everlasting agent's learning process. As of formal features, in this system, most classical principles hold, except the law of executed middle, and this system fails to have more exponents, but it has disjunction property. If having disjunction property and not having the law of executed middle are marks of being constructivist, this logic is uh, constructivist logic. But all in all, this is stronger than intuitionistic logic and closer to classical logic. 
this is a, a curious fact, thinking that strict finitism could be seen as the intuitionist finitism. Putting it in the classical framework, maybe just lifting the finitistic restrictions on it, then the resulting system should be intuitionistic logic. But it is not the case. It is an open and interesting question how to interpret this logic. Thanks for watching.